Let's talk about Keel Auditorium for a second. <laughs> this is its last full year in business. It closes in 91. It's demolished in 92. Originally, it was called the St. Louis Municipal Auditorium. Uh, they were even home of the St. Louis University basketball team. They hosted the NBA team, the St. Louis Hawks, from 55 to 68. Uh, this is essentially, I, I guess, until the 1970s, maybe, considered second only to Madison Square Garden as America's most famous wrestling arena. It, it featured three different NWA world title changes from 59 to 86. It's a big time territory. This is a big time building. And it was probably a thrill for an old timer like yourself to be able to call such an event here. So, so, so rich in history, right? So I was an old timer in 90. What the fuck's that make me an elk on red? Well, you're, you're an old timer now. Source? How many guys do you think are still actively in the business who performed in Keel? I don't know. I mean, it can't Not as many, you know, it's fear by the year, obviously it's, it's rarefied air and, and it's so rich in wrestling history. It just feels like this would have been a thrill for a young Jim. It, it was, that was a thrill for me. It was a thrill meeting Sam Mutchnick and hearing his stories mm -hmm. and, and, and asking, a, asking him questions. I asked Sam a lot of questions on how to, on basically talent relations type questions. How do you handle, how do you handle this kind of an issue? How would you handle this kind of an issue, et cetera, et cetera. I never talked to him about booking because I was never the booker. Uh, and just a fantasy book with Sam Mutchnick was, I don't know. I'd rather find out things that would help me do my job. So I, uh, I met Sam and, and heard Jim heard was a big fan of Sam Mutchnick. They worked together. They were buddies. I know he was always funny. He always called him Sammy. Uh, now I talked to Sammy today. I had to have a jam. It takes a lot of fuel to run this engine. Uh, so uh, I like Mr. Mutchnick a lot. I, I wanted, I was curious as to how he handles megalomaniacal, megalomaniacal, what do you call it? Uh, stars. Right. How did you manage the egos, Mr. Sam? Just think that Luthes didn't have an ego, for example, <laughs> would be ridiculous. Of course. Anybody that's made the, the, whose name is put above the title and they know full well it's put above the title because they're the popular choice that they didn't win a real match. They didn't win a real match to achieve that, this, that the distinction. Then you have ego issues. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Prepare for that. And I asked him how he handled it. The various major personalities that he worked with, uh, how he handled their egos. And how he dealt with that kind of stuff. It was amazing help to me. It's like sitting in a class with somebody that wrote the book. So that was really cool. Um, and there was something else I was going to say about Sam. Oh, Sam had the ability to work with a, a variety of promoters who all had different agendas. They trusted Sam. Sam didn't want to start a territory. Sam ran St. Louis. So there was a different mindset that I don't want to, I'm not going to put my TV in your territory. I'm not going to do this, or that. So he did his own TV and he made sure that your stars that you allowed him to book were taken care of. I mean, that doesn't mean they won every time that's not being taken care of. Now today's world is wins and losses uh, more often than not mean something, but nonetheless, it should, and they should, but Sam was just a different dude, man. People, he, he, <coughs> he was much like Paul Bosch in Houston. The other promoters trusted him to be honorable and keep his word and take care of their guys. And the really, the, the real way you take care of guys in pro wrestling is you pay them. It's not that they go over. Did I slip over brother? Did you take care of me? You know, God, how old are you? 40. It's fucking play fighting. Shut up and put your money in the bank. So that's what Sam was, Sam was great about taking care of people, respecting them, booking them well, giving them a chance to have good matches, go back and look at some of his trends, how he booked this is textbook stuff. And I don't know that a lot of talents today would enjoy working in St. Louis because there's going to be a time when you got to lose clean with a finish hold. And if you can't lose to somebody else's finish hold. I don't know how you, I don't know how you get booked. Right. It's like saying you're John Wayne. You said, okay, look, I got to get hit with three arrows, two bullets and ran over by a Buffalo and then I'll die. 
but one shot to the arm and me bleed out ain't gonna whatever. I guess we glossed over the fact that uh, Sam Mushnick helped open the show here. As a kid, I, I couldn't really appreciate Sam Mushnick and what his contributions to the business were. I, of course, now as an adult, having read more and learned more about the art form of professional wrestling, I, I have a much bigger appreciation. But he does feel, and I think Meltzer even addressed it. Let me see if I can find it here. There was a feeling that he was out of place here because the concepts that uh, of wrestling that Mushnick promoted are 100% at odds with the concepts of world championship wrestling. I kind of thought it was a nice thing. If only for the, the, the local crowd to have Sam there. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, hell yeah. Anytime he's, he's the local hook, right? Sam St. Louis wrestling was the hook to build that show around. You know, I think we had another event there. Uh, I don't think this is it, where we had all the NWA champions come Terry and Dory and Jack, all those guys. Remember that I did. There was a famous picture out there of that, of, of Mr. Sam and all his boys, all former NWA champions that became bigger than life in St. Louis. Right. So, uh, yes, you got to use those local hooks. And that's, that's the thing about. Sam was, Sam was a former newspaper guy. So he, and he was a big time writer there, I, I guess the St. Louis was a post dispatch or something like that major paper, you know, they had the Cardinals, they had Stan Musial, they had, they had a great era of sports there, football is NFL uh, work. So, uh, anyway, I think Sam had a lot of connections and he was very well liked. He was almost beloved. Mr. Sam was a good man and he helped charities and. He, he was a part of his community and that's what made some of those local promoters. So, uh, successful, go back and look at Bosch's work. Bosch is a big charity guy, local charities, Eddie Graham, boys and girls club. You know, he started the boys club, boys ranch or something. Uh, funks, the same thing. All these promoters had the same MO that they, they utilized, uh, their clout, their name identity and their platform to contribute to the community. And, uh, so Sam was right there at the top of that list of doing that. So he was very well loved in that community. So the more, the more, uh, acknowledgement could be thrown his way, the better, because he was a subject that the writers and the local media would cover. Mr. Sam was still, still, uh, you know, living large in this market that he, he, he grew up in. So he was real important for us in that regard. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.